We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. Whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. Space, the final frontier. Star Trek probably is the most important science fiction show ever. To boldly go where no man has gone before. And there were interesting things being done. Science fiction ideas were constantly being played with. Maybe old ideas, but new to television. It is fantastically kind of um, optimistic and ambitious and, and had um, ideals and, and aspirations. Science fiction allowed us to go, literally, where other stories weren't going. Ex-World War II pilot and TV producer Gene Roddenberry created a warm and cuddly environment aboard the Starship Enterprise with a utopian vision of a world coming together and zapping any Borshi aliens that stood in their way. As entertainment, though, it was irresistible, and, and the power of the ideas that were coming through into a 60s, 70s, you know, childhood were, were fabulous. I mean, as intellectuals and, and adults, we can look at it and, and decry some of them, but some of them had real power. Go to red alert. Prepare to fire phaser banks. Sensors, lock off. Firing phases, kept. It was a uh, rip-snorting good uh, space opera, uh, and that's how you have to engage the audience number one. They were sort of cool. I mean, you know, Captain Kirk was a, a cool guy. He got all the babes every week. You're beautiful. Kiss me. He was the clean-cut, all-American guy with uh, overactive libido. Kirk wasn't always in control, and I think that was part of his appeal. He was very human. <laughs> The audience loved the character because of that. Spock was completely the opposite. Um, you didn't always know what he was coming from. You didn't know what he was thinking. There was definitely something about the love between Kirk and Spock, the unusual love between them, that somehow summed up the series and, and the kind of tolerance. And uh, one of the few times you'd ever get a smile from Spock would be, you know, if you found out that he thought Jim had died and in fact he was still alive. Captain! Jim! The cartoon characters, the feeling for each other, which I thought was very interesting. Hand in hand, Kirk and Spock explore the universe with their Rainbow Nation crew. It was kind of like Mind Your Language in space. All races, creeds, um, religions uh, had somehow managed to come together and work in harmony, that we had a very positive future to look forward to. It was always meant to be a mixed crew. It was always meant to be a multi-ethnic crew. Uh, there were some stations in the South that pulled uh, the show from its uh, schedule because we had a black woman in a fairly leading role. This is a pretty big thing in America in the 1960s. Um, we look back at the show now and we wouldn't raise an eyebrow at things like that, but um, it was a pretty big deal at the time. Any contact, Lieutenant? Feeling on all frequencies, sir. All languages have been attempted. No response. Now using standard interstellar symbols. It was really the first strong woman's role on television. Well, I, I think that Star Trek's liberalism is genuine, but there are limits to it. There's a certain smugness to its you know, multiracial, multinational cast. The black woman on Star Trek, okay, she's, she's on the bridge, but she's the receptionist. The Trekkies would hold it up to be a fantastic kind of um, representation of the future being, you know, about uh, tolerance and, and truth. Uh, and, and the anti-Trekkies would, would say that, um, you know, how come the world was so Americanized? To me, Star Trek has always been an instrument of American foreign policy. <laughs> There's this notion, they keep talking about the, the Prime Directive, which is non-interference, which they seem to break every week. Out here, we're the only policemen around. And a crime has been committed, do I make myself clear? It was a groundbreaking series. I think there's an awful lot of nonsense associated with it now in retrospect, because we tend to look back at things, I, probably with 
rose-tinted spectacles, but also we tend to think things better now than they probably were. And uh, there, there's an awful lot of silliness in Star Trek as well. Hey, out there. Indeed, in a desperate bid to improve dodgy ratings, things did get a bit silly. I had mixed feelings when the series was cancelled at the end of the third season. I was relieved to some degree because I was distressed about the direction the stories were taking. I was not happy with the, with the quality of the work we were doing. I thought by and large we, had, we were on a downhill slide. It's very hard to create new ideas. When you're doing a science fiction show, it's even more difficult because um, you have to come up with more outlandish ideas. And it, it could be argued that maybe by the end of season three, they were starting to run dry. <laughs> Go on. We battled Klingons and all sorts of aliens, but we found that the most uh, destructive Klingons were the NBC programming people. And by the time man landed on the moon, Star Trek's five-year mission had been cut short in only the third series. <laughs> but all was not lost. Trekkers of the World United, and after a ten-year campaign, it was finally decided to make a motion picture called Star Trek, the motion picture. The box office exploded, and so they did a sequel. Who would have thunk? But they said that's going to be the only sequel. And then it turned into this whole uh, motion picture series. And then who would have thunk? There was a spin-off, Next Generation, and another spin-off, and another spin-off, and now another one. Here it is, the 35th year. I mean, who would have thunk? <laughs>